welcome to the latest virtual program from the Massachusetts Historical Society. My name is Catherine Algor and I'm the president here. The Society is the first historical society in the nation. We've been collecting since 1791 all the way through to today. And our jo job here uh, is to make this collection, which is at 14 million items and counting, useful to as many people as possible. So we have a robust teacher training program. We educate students in civics and history through National History Day in Massachusetts. And we have a range of activities from exhibitions to public programs like this for people like you, the intellectually curious. I'm also really proud to tell you that most everything we do, we do for free because history is too important to charge for it. Now you may ask how we're able to do that. You might think from our name that we get money from the state, but we are a private organization. And it is a large and generous group of supporters who make all of this possible. And I know a lot of you are out there, so I wanna say thank you very much. And I'd like to invite the rest of you to join our community. If you go to our website, masshist.org, and click the little support button, it'll tell you how to give a gift, or better yet, become a member. And poke around the site while you're there. I think you'll find some very compelling things. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Let's get started. And so let me turn you over to the Director of Public Programs, Exhibitions and Community Engagement, Gavin Cleesbees. Uh, and welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships. I hope everyone is prepared uh, for the celebration of Independence Day with an awareness that this will probably be a slightly different Independence Day celebration than, than family traditions of the past. Uh, today, we'll be taking a look uh, at talking about the history of the Presidential Cabinet in America. The U.S. Constitution never established a cabinet, and in fact, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected the idea. However, on November 26, 1791, George Washington convened his department secretaries, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, Henry Knox, and Edmund Randolph, for the first cabinet meeting. This evening, we'll talk about how and why George Washington created one of the most powerful bodies in the federal government. Uh, Today, uh, our speaker will be uh, Lindsay Trevinsky, who is the author of The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. Uh, Ms. Trevinsky is an expert on the cabinet, presidential history, and US government institutions. She is the scholar in residence at the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College and the senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. She received her BA in history and political science from George Washington University and com completed uh, her master's and PhD from the University of California, Davis. Her work has also been published in Time, the Washington Post, the Journal of the Early Republic, uh, and Law and History Review. It is of special note particularly to MHS members who have a, a deep and abiding uh, uh, appreciation of the Adams family, uh, that when she is not writing, researching, or speaking about history, she loves to hike with her husband and their dog that is named John Quincy Dog Adams. You can contact me or Sarah Bertulli, our public programs coordinator, through programs at masshist.org. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Lindsay Trevinsky uh, and ask her to begin speaking. Thanks. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to pull up a little uh, presentation here for you to see. Um, one of the amazing things about this uh, virtual experience these days, while I of course wish that we were together in person, is that I have an opportunity to speak to people across the country. And um, I know that all of you would probably not be able to make your way into Boston should uh, the pandemic not be taking place. So I am grateful for that opportunity. Uh, that being said, I, I think some of you maybe have, you know, heard me speak about the cabinet before. So it ups the ante to make it a little bit interesting and different each time. And given our wonderful virtual hosts, I decided to take a little bit of a different approach for tonight's talk um, in a way that I couldn't usually do if I was speaking at a different site. And so today I will be talking about the cabinet experiences that were very unique of three very different men, Henry Knox, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. And they all had um, wildly different experiences in the cabinet, but I'd like to talk a little bit about them and then what that tells us about the cabinet experience and uh, the legacy that Washington left. And I hope it also sort of piques your curiosity and will inspire you to 
pick up the book or borrow the book or ask your library for the book to learn more. Um, so to start, as Gavin kindly said, the first cabinet meeting took place on November 26th, 1791. And that was two and a half years into Washington's administration. And I'd like to emphasize that date because um, it's very important to note that Washington did not go into his presidency intending to create a cabinet. He did not create a cabinet on day one. And in the first couple of years, he really relied on in-person consultations and written correspondence with the department secretaries. And he did so for one really big reason. And that's that the constitution does not have the cabinet in it. Um, in fact, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected all proposals for a cabinet and instead put two provisions in the Article 2 of Excuse me, we seem to be having a little technical difficulty. The Constitution that would provide advice and support. Um, have we unfroze here? We're doing fine now. Uh, we had a little bit of a blip there. Okay. Um, so uh, um, I don't know where I cut off. But anyway, so there were two options that were available to Washington. The first was that he could have written advice from the department secretaries. And this was very important because written advice meant that there would be a paper trail or there would be evidence about who said what and who advocated which position. The second was that the president could meet with the Senate and get their advice and consent on foreign policy. And this is really important to sort of distinguish between our current situation where we sort of expect that the Senate will either be a, um, a check on uh, presidential treaties and appointments through a veto, or we'll just approve them out of, right out of hand. Instead, uh, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention expected that the Senate would be a safe advisory body. And I say safe because they were indirectly elected through their state legislatures. And so they could be recalled, again, if they gave bad advice or, or advocated for bad positions. So when Washington entered into office, he really intended to pursue these two things. And he appointed cabinet secretaries that he thought would be able to give him really good advice including, of course, Henry Knox. So uh, these are kind of the major hits of Knox's CV, if you will. He was the major general of the artillery by the end of the war. He was the Secretary of War for the Confederation Congress. And then he stayed in office as the Secretary of War for George Washington. It's likely that Knox and Washington probably met at Longfellow House, which maybe is familiar to some of you in the sort of Cambridge area. This was where Washington had his headquarters during the Cambridge and Boston campaign. Um, Knox was a, a very influential officer during Washington's early years and throughout the war. He first gained his acclaim and sort of his fame uh, during the famous Fort Ticonderoga mission where he went up to Fort Ticonderoga and retrieved the cannons and brought them back and permitted Washington to oversee a very successful campaign and basically force the British out of Boston Harbor. Um, this really in inspired Washington to think that Knox kind of had a can-do attitude or a, a yes mentality that he was willing to try anything. And that was really important during the war. And he brought that approach to all of the councils of war that he attended. And based on my records and what I've been able to find based on the evidence, I'm pretty sure that Knox was at almost every single council of war that Washington convened. And he organized these before entering into major military engagement, before selecting the site of winter quarters, which were a really important strategic decision, before deciding on a retreat, you name it. Washington convened a council of war to discuss the issue, and Knox was present. Knox was also there for some of the really low moments of the war, including Valley Forge, and he saw firsthand how much the army suffered when Congress was unable, unwilling, or just um, incapable of pulling together the sort of support and material goods that the army needed. And this experience is really essential to understanding his future advice and his future role in the cabinet because he saw for eight years, he was in the army for eight years, um, how difficult it was to have a nation operate without a strong executive and without a strong federal government. 
So we're going to come back to that in a little bit, but just remember that he too was at all of these places seeing the real challenges that the army was facing. So when Knox was in office as Secretary of War, he went with Washington to the Senate when Washington intended to go and get the Senate's advice on foreign affairs. Um, he was present when Washington tried to use the sort of constitutional option, um, which as sort of a spoiler alert went very badly because the Senate wanted to deliberate and, and sort of discuss privately in a committee and then have Washington come back later. And Washington really wanted immediate advice um, but this meeting is a really important reminder that Knox was an essential part of Washington's administration, especially in the first couple of years. It's easy now sort of in retrospect to focus on Hamilton and Jefferson, the sort of domestic rebellions and international crises and uh, political squabbling that happened later. But in the first couple of years, Washington's attention was actually really consumed by relationships with Native Americans and trying to figure out how to maintain peace on the Western border. And he really viewed that as a, um, a foreign affairs issue, which was in fact the reason he went to the Senate that, that one time in August of 1789. And uh, relationships with Native Americans were under the purview of the Secretary of War at that point. So Knox was an essential part of his, of Washington's administration, and they worked incredibly closely together, which was sort of a natural fit because they had at that point been friends for decades. Some of the sort of later issues that came to dominate the cabinet, this is a picture of the group together. Knox is the second from the left. He's perhaps some of the, the less uh, recognizable unless you're familiar with his more robust portraits. Um, some of the later issues that came to dominate Knox's attention and the, the cabinet more broadly were the Neutrality Crisis and the Whiskey Rebellion. And in the Neutrality Crisis and the Whiskey Rebellion, the cabinet was tasked with figuring out what the president's role was supposed to be in figuring out uh, these issues. The Neutrality Crisis uh, broke out in early 1793 when France declared war on Great Britain and the United States was tasked with figuring out how to remain neutral in this international conflict. And you might think, well, that's kind of a simple issue. I don't know why that would be such a problem. But there are a ton of legal questions that come along with neutrality. So, for example, after Washington proclaimed that the United States was going to remain neutral, what happens when citizens decide to ignore that order? What happens if they're caught fighting on one or the other sides? Who is going to enforce that? What court are they going to be tried in? Who is going to decide on the punishment? And then on an international perspective, what happens if some of the foreign powers ignore your neutrality? What happens when there are privateers or the private ships that were owned by individuals and sailing under sort of a letter of mark from the foreign powers come into your ports? Can they bring anything they want with them? Can they buy anything they want, even if it means like guns and ammunition? So these were just a couple of the questions that the administration was facing. And, and Hamilton and Knox both pushed for a very strong position that asserted the president's authority over diplomatic affairs. And um, this is really important because Knox's reputation in the cabinet and his role in the administration is really colored by Jefferson's perspective. Um, we all are probably familiar with the phrase, you know, history is written by the victors. And um, in this case, that's absolutely true. Our opinions of Knox and our understanding in history books of his contributions are colored by Jefferson's perception that he was Hamilton's toady. And that was definitely not the case. They often agreed on the right, on the same outcome, but he got there because of his own experiences and his own um, his own knowledge that he had earned sort of through blood, sweat, and tears. The Whiskey Rebellion is another great example. In 1794, a domestic rebellion broke out in Western Pennsylvania and uh, the cabinet was again tasked with trying to figure out what the president's role should be, how involved he should be, whether Congress should be more involved, whether they should leave it to the states. And Knox's perspective and his role in the Shays Rebellion, which had broken out in 1786, 1787, in which he had seen that the Confederation Congress had utterly failed to suppress this rebellion, really colored his advice 
to Washington in 1794. He basically said you should immediately resort to military action, which Washington didn't go quite that far, but he certainly did decide to support a strong military position. He carved out a sphere of influence for the president over domestic issues, and he really sidelined Congress and the states with Knox's approval and encouragement. Now, unfortunately, Knox's relationship with Washington with the cabinet sort of deteriorated at the end of 1794. Um, he was from very humble beginnings, and so he had managed to save up some money and to buy an estate in Maine. And in 1794, it was basically teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. And so he requested permission um, as the Whiskey Rebellion was sort of starting to heat up in early fall to go back to Maine and, and put his affairs in order. And Washington sort of reluctantly gave his approval. And then in what I can only think is maybe tiredness after decades of public service, or certainly bad judgment, Knox decided to stay for several weeks and sort of dilly-dallied. And we know that Washington was desperate for him to come back and desperate for his support and advice because he wrote letters asking where he was, hoping that he would return back to Philadelphia before Washington had to march out with troops to Western Pennsylvania. And he was really upset that Knox wasn't there. Knox unfortunately did not return before Washington left Philadelphia and that sort of soured their relationship because Washington really thought that public service needed to be put before your own personal needs. The kind of final blow to their relationship occurred in 1798 when Washington decided to appoint uh, Alexander Hamilton as his number two. Henry Knox had outranked Hamilton by many, many, many ranks during the war and really saw it as an insult and actually the last letter that I was able to find from Knox to Washington, the last line of it is, I will detain you not one moment longer than to say in the presence of almighty God that there is not a creature upon the surface of this globe who was, is, and will remain more your sincere friend than H. Knox, which is a pretty intense way to end a letter. Next, John Adams. Uh, I'm sure a familiar face to all of you MHS supporters, and I sure, I'm sure I don't need to sort of read his uh, great CV to you here, but just um, a couple of key points that sort of explain his perspective on the cabinet, explain his perspective on the administration and sort of where he was coming from. I think Adams, just like all of the other framers and founders and first office holders, were shaped by their experiences, and it's so important to remember that. So just a couple of um, key hits. John Adams was instrumental in getting the Declaration of Independence passed. He was instrumental in getting Washington appointed as commander in chief. This face here will show up again and again as we talk through this story. Um, he then went and he served as um, various different ministers, including on the, the Peace Commission to negotiate the treaty the first minister to the Netherlands where he negotiated an essential trade deal and the first minister to Great Britain. So he had extraordinary diplomatic experience. And I think his understanding of the respect due to high office was shaped by his time in Europe. Poor John Adams then discovered that the vice president is pretty much the most thankless task in almost any administration, unless you have a very close relationship uh, to the president, and he did not really. And so um, early on in, in Washington's administration, Adams and Washington did exchange letters. Washington wanted his input about social etiquette, about how the president should um, socialize and host citizens, what sort of events he could go to. So that happened. There were several of those letters in 1789, 1790, in 1794 and in 1795, Washington sent several other um, bits of correspondence asking for Adam's advice. And I should say that it is very possible that they talked about issues of state at events like Martha Washington's drawing rooms, which are sort of pictured here, although I think they were a little bit less elaborate, or the theater where Washington and Adams often went together, or the dinners that Washington held weekly where Adams was a regular attendant. It's very possible that Washington asked for Adams' advice, but I have found no record that Adams was ever invited to a cabinet meeting. 
there's no evidence he was ever there. And so for whatever reason, because unfortunately Washington did not write this part down, he never invited Adams there. I don't know if it was because they just weren't as close or because maybe he didn't think as highly of Adams' um, political instincts after he had advocated for a very lengthy and sort of regal title for the president. It's hard to say, but I have found no evidence that he was ever in that room, um, the room where it happened, so to speak, and the decision-making sphere. So when Adams became president, um, it was an incredibly tumultuous moment. Keep in mind that for those living in the 1790s, when there had been a turnover of power, usually that was accompanied by war, um, a monarch being executed, or death. And so the concept that there would be a peaceful transfer of power was really extraordinary and kind of anxiety provoking because they weren't really sure how it was going to go. So Adams had this bright idea that he would help provide continuity by maintaining the department secretaries that Washington had um, at the end of his administration. And with the benefit of hindsight, we know that that was an absolutely terrible idea. But you can forgive Adams for thinking at that moment that it might help people feel that there was steadiness at the highest levels of government, that he was maintaining some of Washington's practices and precedents. And you can kind of understand why he made that decision. He also really thought that the secretaries would be loyal to the office of the president, not necessarily to him because he understood that they had close relationships with other people but he really thought that the office would hold their highest sense of loyalty. Um, this turned out to be wildly wrong. They were loyal to Alexander Hamilton and they worked to undermine his election, his reelection campaign. They worked to sabotage his foreign policy and they outright um, ignored his orders. But Adams left a very critical precedent in that he actually fired. He was the first president to fire a minister. In May of 1801, he fired Timothy Pickering um, in a letter that only John Adams could write. And he wrote, diverse causes and considerations essential to the administration of the government, in my judgment requiring a change in the Department of State, you are hereby discharged from any further service as Secretary of State. No niceties, no thank you for your service, just boom. And this was really important because when the first federal Congress had created the departments in 1789, they had established that the president and the president alone could remove the secretaries. But as we've seen in the last several years, things that are written down or customs or norms or even laws are all well and fine, but they don't actually have a whole lot of significance and import until they're really put to the test. And in this moment, Adams was putting to the test the president's right to remove the secretaries. And Congress did not push back, which meant that it sort of um, tacitly approved or enforced that this was the president's authority. Lastly, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had perhaps uh, the most divergent cabinet experience of the three. Um, I'm sure you all are all familiar with his sort of exploits as well. Um, this picture is familiar again because he was one of the primary authors of the um, Declaration of Independence, which is so appropriate for this week. He then served as the governor of Virginia and was the minister to France and um, several other foreign appointments as well. In this picture, his house can be seen on the far left. Um, and this was a really important experience because when Washington went about setting up his cabinet, Washington had never been out of the country except for one trip to Barbados when he was a teenager. He didn't speak French when that was the language of diplomacy. He didn't understand how Versailles or the court of St. James worked. He didn't understand the very complicated and tumultuous relationship um, between European nations, which um, contemporary events demonstrate that that sort of relationship is still ongoing and, and a difficult one to navigate. Um, so Washington really needed somebody who did have that expertise. And with Madison's sort of suggestion or, you know, subtle pushing, he selected Jefferson to fill that position. Um, this is just another sort of depiction of, of the cabinet here. 
And Jefferson, um, for all of his complaining and his dislike of the cabinet, which there was a great deal for him to dislike, uh, he hated conflict, he hated intense, fiery debates, and um, the cabinet quickly devolved into that because of Jefferson and Hamilton's sort of diametrically opposed views about everything. Jefferson actually had a huge impact on Washington's administration and the outcome of events. Um, you might not believe it based on his writings, but Washington actually sided with Jefferson almost as frequently as he sided with Hamilton. Not necessarily like every other time, but more often than not, Washington saw the value in what Jefferson had to say and either sided with him or tried to find a middle ground. And as early as 1792, Jefferson was saying he wanted to retire and Washington pleaded with him to stay in office. And he pleaded with him for over a year and he got Jefferson to agree to stay to early 1793. And then when the neutrality crisis broke out, he stayed until the end of 1793. So Washington was able to get Jefferson to serve for almost two additional years because his input was so important. That being said, um, Jefferson did despise the experience. He often referred to cabinet deliberations as a cockfight which brings to mind a very sort of bloody, physical, intense experience. And when he was president, he had no intention of recreating that atmosphere. I don't wanna to go too much into what his cabinet looked like because um, Adam's cabinet and Jefferson's cabinet are actually the topic of my next project. So I have to leave a little bit for suspense. Um, but Jefferson was quite meticulous about what cabinet interactions in his administration would look like. And in November 1801, he wrote a letter to his secretaries saying that they would follow Washington's first term model. And he was very particular that that meant that Jefferson would be in control of all facts, all correspondence would go through his office, and cabinet meetings would be relatively rare and only when there was an important, a really important subject that came up. Jefferson went one step further in that he only convened cabinet meetings when he knew it would be productive and when he knew what the secretaries were going to say ahead of time. And he has left copious evidence that when he didn't think that was going to be the outcome, he went to the secretaries one at a time. So he was very careful about um, organizing what the cabinet would look like. But these three experiences really actually tell us a lot about Washington's cabinet legacy. Washington left this precedent that each president gets to decide what his or her cabinet is going to look like, who they're going to be closest to, whose advice they're going to listen to, how frequently they're going to discuss issues. And the public and Congress really have very little oversight over those relationships. So sometimes like in the case of Jefferson, where he was really excellent at managing those relationships and actually had the least turnover in cabinet history, the cabinet can be an amazing um, tool for a public liaison to build congressional coalitions, to serve internationally as representatives of the administration, or if presidents are unwilling or unable to manage those personalities like poor Don Adams, um, whose cabinet was borderline treasonous, that can go very badly. Um, and that is a legacy we continue to see throughout American history. There have been examples of extraordinary cabinets and examples of terrifically awful cabinets as well. And I think that that's one of Washington's most underappreciated legacies and one that I hope I've inspired you to learn a little bit more about. So um, I am now really, really thrilled to um, hear your questions. Uh, I think that the question and answer portion is actually my favorite because I love to hear what you want to know about and um, be able to answer those questions in whatever way I can. So, uh, Megan wrote, uh, great talk, Lindsay. I, I'm wondering about illustrations, paintings of the various cabinets, such as the cover image of your book. Do you notice any themes or trends in the way that the uh, president and his cabinet are depicted in these images? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Megan. Um, so the amazing thing about the cover of my book is that that image was actually on a cigar box um, that was created, I think, in the 19th century. So. Um, unsurprisingly, there are no contemporary images. Photography, of course, was not in existence yet. And um, based on what I can tell, most of the images of all of the guys together, um, I call them all my 
dead old white dudes, um, all of my dead white dudes in a, in a group, those images actually weren't created until the 19th century, um, largely as a byproduct of the sort of um, celebration of the nation that occurred both in the 1850s and after the Civil War as an effort to kind of find a common history that we can all come together around. Um, so that's where I actually see like a lot of the Courier and Ives stuff. It comes out later as a, as a way to celebrate um, the past and how they would like it to be. So for example, the cover of my book has John Adams in there. And as I said, he was never in a cabinet meeting. So um, they take, they like to take some liberties with the depictions. Okay. Um, so Casey wrote, what was the most personally interesting or surprising fact you learned while researching this book? Hmm. Most surprising fact. Oh, here's a great one. Um, which is one that I've actually had the pleasure of discussing with some of the Adams Papers editors. Uh, so Washington never used the word cabinet um, while he was president. It was very much in the sort of political vocabulary as early as 1792. Madison was writing letters to Jefferson and saying, you know, did this come up in the cabinet? Uh, Jefferson and Hamilton were talking about um, cabinet meetings and cabinet notes, things like that. But Washington never did um, until he retired. And then he very quickly referred to it as John Adams cabinet. So he clearly had that understanding of what it was and what it was called. Um, and the only reason that I can speculate that he didn't write it down in that way um, was that perhaps he didn't want to be compared to the British cabinet. And so if he could not talk about it, then maybe it wouldn't occur. And instead, he said he referred to the either the gentlemen of my family, so his official family were, were the secretaries, or um, the secretaries. That's what he called them. So there's a person with their hand up, uh, Evangeline. Uh, so um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask a question. This may have been a mistaken hand raised. So we'll move on. Uh, to a, oops, sorry, uh, to another question. Sarah uh, from MHS uh, wrote, thanks for a great talk, Lindsay. Uh, can you say a little bit about the wives of the cabinet members and their relationships? Absolutely. So um, the wives, although of course they weren't in cabinet meetings, they sort of played an essential behind the scenes role. Um, and that picture that I showed of Martha Washington's drawing rooms are a great example of why. So they hosted events that were considered sort of semi-public, semi-private. And because women were there, it was assumed that they were non-political events. Now, of course, that was rubbish because women talked about politics then as much as they did now. And um, as well as theater and culture and, you know, family gossip and international affairs and war and everything in between. Um, but because women were present, there was sort of this veil that was put over the event. And because Martha was the host of those events, it gave George the opportunity to be a private citizen. And so he used those events to discuss issues of state with senators or congressmen and sort of let known his wishes um, in a way that he could not have done had he been the host, because it would have been considered um, improper politicking or would have been considered an effort to interfere with congressional affairs. Um, so that was one really important way by facilitating these interactions um, and their presence basically was a disguise. The other really important way is that I mentioned that, uh, that Washington called the secretary as part of his official family. And he truly felt that way. Um, this was a holdover from the Revolutionary War where his officers and his aides were his official family. And the women were a really essential part of that sort of group that helped build an esprit de corps among these, um, this group of people. They, the women during the war would come during um, winter quarters and would have balls and dances and go riding on horses. And when Washington was president, the secretaries and their wives did similar activities. They went to go visit gardens, they went to the theater, they hosted each other for social events. And sometimes those social bonds helped smooth over the hurt feelings that occurred during political debates. Um, not really the case in terms of Hamilton and Jefferson, they hated each other and no amount of theater or tea was going to make that go away. Um, but it did, it did certainly help. Judy, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? <laughs> 
Now, I just want to tell you how much I enjoy this. This, this is the first one I've come to. And thank you so much for uh, your delightful book. I'm going to be reading it. Oh, well, thank you so much. I so appreciate that. I'm so glad you're here. And thank you for making this one the first one. Um, and I, I hope you enjoy the cabinet. It's a it's good reading for the long 4th of July weekend. Okay, well, Harriet typed in a question. She said, how much of the discord between cabinet members was due to policy differences versus personality or other factors? Great question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weasel out of it, and I'm going to say both. Um, so I think that Hamilton and Jefferson were um, likely to disagree no matter what their personalities were because they had fundamentally different views of what the nation should be. Everything from... Jefferson thought that the nation should be a country of farmers and um, the nation should be small with little military investment and industry should remain small and trade should be sort of limited um, and, and was pro-French. And Jefferson, or excuse me, Hamilton um, was pro-industry and pro-merchant trade and pro-British. So they literally, like every single issue, um, they were on opposite sides of, which doesn't necessarily make for a good relationship. But then I think personality wise, they also had wildly different presentations of masculinity, of ideas about what a virtuous Republican, and this is little r Republican, should be. And I think a lot of that is informed by their war experience. So Hamilton um, was an aide de camp and then an officer. He was used to battlefields and conversations in you know, campaign tents, and those tended to get loud and kind of combative. And it was a very sort of intensely masculine militaristic atmosphere and there were dogs and horses and bugs and it probably smelled and you know all of these things. Jefferson was used to diplomatic uh, diplomatic scenes and in diplomacy if you're raising your voice or coming to blows then diplomacy has failed and so his goal was always to maintain sort of a smooth line of conversation which was facilitated by fine wine and dining and servants and enslaved people who provided anything you could possibly hope for. And so I think they just, um, not only did they have such different world perspectives, but their lives had been so different that they just clashed in every way. So uh, Brian wrote, uh, in your book, you mentioned a few items Washington toyed with, Senate consul, Supreme Court consul, and a quasi prime minister. Which was the biggest bullet he dodged by passing on them? Oh, good question. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the most challenging option, I don't think the Supreme Court was willing to really participate the way he wanted to. Hmm. So I think that um, the most challenging option would have been the prime minister, prime minister style relationship, whether that was through the vice president who was uh, the president of the Senate in his capacity, or it was a, a good relationship, sort of an unofficial relationship with someone like James Madison. Um, that worked early on when, you know, it was relatively small and, and those personal relationships were key. And one of my favorite stories to tell, because it's almost too hard to believe, is that when Washington wrote his, his first inauguration address, um, Madison really drafted most of it. And then Madison drafted Congress's reply to Washington. And then Madison helped draft Washington's reply back to Congress. So he was essentially having a conversation with himself. Um, that would not have, I think, worked long term. And the way that the government is set up with the different branches, having that sort of pseudo prime minister person would have seriously thrown some, some kinks in the wheel. Um, Betsy wrote, uh, from what I remember, George Washington likes to get many opinions before acting. If he had not been that type of leader, do you think the cabinet would have become the standard it is today? Oh, that's a good counterfactual. Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so as you pointed out, that was, I think, one of Washington's greatest strengths as a leader was his understanding of um, what was important for leadership and um, his understanding of his own limitations and what he was good at and what he wasn't. And so he surrounded himself with people who um, knew more about certain subjects and he wasn't afraid to ask for their input and then listen. Um, and most of the presidents who have been effective leaders have replicated that model in one way or another. Um, the presidency is simply too big of a role 
for one person to know everything and have all the skills that are required to do the job. So you have to surround yourself with people who offer other things. Um, had he not been that person, who, um, had he not been that person, my guess is that um, maybe the Senate would have, have maintained um, more importance because the immediate feedback would have been less important. Like, it, I mean, Washington really wanted them to debate and to provide advice right away. Um, and maybe the, a, a different president wouldn't have cared about that sort of delay as much. Um, I also think that had it been someone who wasn't willing to ask for input, the first couple of years would have gone pretty badly um, because there were a lot of the 1790s is a moment of extraordinary anxiety. Um, there is fiscal uncertainty. The economy is in shambles. The country has no credit. There is constantly the risk of war. Um, the various factions among the states, they have very little emotional ties to each other. So, I mean, the, the threats were just everywhere. And so someone who was sort of bullheaded and unwilling to ask for advice was probably going to get into some trouble. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, so Casey wrote, uh, aside from Washington starting the cabinet, uh, where was there any other president that made major notable shifts to the idea or the role of the cabinet? Um, yes. So there have been several. Um, the biggest shifts tend to happen when um, cabinet, um, the makeup of the cabinet changes. So FDR expanded the cabinet pretty broadly. The creation of the National Security Council changed the makeup of the cabinet a great deal as well because it was this additional body who took on some of the responsibilities that the cabinet had previously been sort of in charge of. Um, some of the other ones that are, are notable um, uh, of course, you know, Lincoln is famous for his team of rivals. And mm -hmm. I would, I would say that pretty much every president up until that point had a team of rivals as well. So that was a, a well-established practice. Um, but then I think one of the other big shifts that we don't necessarily appreciate is after Jefferson retired from office, Washington decided that he would really only appoint federalists or at least leaning federalists. And so, um, from that point forward, presidents have mostly only appointed cabinets from their party. There are, of course, some notable exceptions. FDR had a couple of Republicans in his cabinet during the war to have good um, administration unity. Um, President Obama, President Reagan have had a had a, like a, a single person that they felt that they could really agree with on a, on a particular topic. Um, but that that legacy is an important one as well. So I think we have time for a couple more questions, but uh, Great. one or two more. Um, so Laura wrote, uh, do you think the office of the vice president would have been uh, different uh, throughout history if Washington and Adams had had a better relationship? Um, I do think it certainly would have been different for the, for the first administration. Um, so much of what we know about the presidency um, is unwritten and so much of the federal government is actually unwritten and it's actually custom and norm that was fleshed out uh, in the first couple of administrations. If we think about, you know, what article two looks like, it's really quite short. There's very little there and there's very little written down. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is sort of up to who's in the office to figure out. And I certainly think that the vice president could have taken on a much greater role if it had been someone like John Jay or even maybe James Madison, um, although he didn't really have the stature at the time to be um, vice president. Um, and I mean, we have seen examples in history, um, Obama and Biden are a great example where the vice president takes on much more responsibility when the personalities permit. Um, and so that's really one of those interesting aspects about the presidency that is so flexible and can morph and change depending on, on who's in power. So uh, for our last question, uh, Brad said, uh, could you speak about how effectively Washington led these cabinet meetings? Um, how did he manage these strong personalities and conflicts? Were there any blowups where, where any of his ministers walked out or behaved inappropriately? You may not be able to know that last part. <laughs> more about um, the... Uh, yes, they certainly behaved inappropriately. Um, they kept records of each other's inappropriate behavior. <laughs> Um, so the way that Washington managed his cabinets was actually a holdover from how he managed his councils of war. Um, and I talk about this in the book a great deal that Washington had this method where he would send out a list of questions ahead of time. 
for the officers or the secretaries to consider. And then he would use that list as sort of his agenda for the day and uh, try and keep them on point, uh, which worked with varying degrees of success. Um, and then if the secretaries or the officers disagreed, he would ask for written opinions at the end. And the written opinions um, did a number of things. First, they allowed him to make a decision in his own time. Washington tended to ponder for a while. And then once he decided on an option, he implemented it with alacrity and firmness. Um, so he, he needed some time to consider all of the options. It ensured that he had all of the information he needed to make that decision. Um, and lastly, it ensured that he had um, a record of support if he decided to go with one side or the other, especially if it was a politically controversial decision. He could make sure that he could say like, you know, this person told me so. Um, he never actually did that, but had he wanted to, he could. Um, and that worked-ish, but the thing is, is that Washington actually really liked it when the secretaries debated and when they argued, because for him, it was a way to sort of see the strengths and weaknesses of the different sides and allow them to poke holes in each other's arguments. So he kind of just sat back and let them debate it all out, including um, there's a great moment, or not so great if you were Jefferson, um, a great moment in August of 1793, and the cabinet was meeting up to five times per week at this point for several hours a day in Philadelphia in August in a room that was only about 15 by 21 feet. It was quite full of furniture. There were five very large guys in this room and Hamilton and Jefferson hated each other and there was no air conditioning. And um, we know that summer was very hot because there was a really bad yellow fever outbreak that fall. So they're in these meetings, and at one point, Jefferson writes that Hamilton gave a jury speech for 45 minutes um, uninterrupted, which we know from various other descriptions that Hamilton tended to gesticulate wildly and pace when he talked. So imagine sitting in a meeting, and it's been going on for a while, and one person talks for 45 minutes, and you can just see Jefferson's head exploding. And the best part is they went back the next day and Hamilton did the exact same thing and spoke for another <laughs> 45 minutes. So um, Washington kind of maintained control, but kind of didn't. Um, and there's some great records, um, especially in Jefferson's notes of the antics that they got up to. Well, thank you very much for our wonderful presentation. And I hope uh, everyone who attended will consider buying the book or getting it out of the library. We uh, always advocate for people to buy uh, books from local bookstores and support their independent um, retailers. Uh, the bookstore closest to the Massachusetts Historical Society is a Trident Bookstores and Cafe. Uh, and there's a link to uh, uh, Ms. Stravinsky's book uh, at Trident Bookstore, which is available now in their warehouse. So you can click on that and order it. Uh, or you can go to bookshop.org, which is um, a site that feeds sales through a series of independent bookstores. So, uh, and if I may, um, anyone who buys the book, I obviously can't sign it for you tonight, and I wish that I could, but um, I'm happy. I have a, a series of personalized book plates that actually have my dog, um, an outline of John Quincy Adams on them. I'm happy to sign them for you. Um, you can send me an email or a message or um, Google it online, and I have a site there as well, and I'm happy to send those to you. It's, it's a wonderful offer. It's a, a, a new way to work around the fact that we don't do book signings anymore. How to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a brave new world. So anyways, uh, I'd like to thank all the people who joined us for this program. Um, and if you enjoyed this program, I also hope you'll consider supporting the Massachusetts Historical Society.